Hey, everybody. I'm Kathleen Jasper, and we are live for our Praxis Core webinar. Really excited to be here with you guys today. Just want to make sure I'm live everywhere and that you guys can hear me okay. Hey oh, let me turn I'm this Kathleen off. Jasper. All right. It looks like I am live. Just checking to see who is in. Go ahead in the chat. Let me know that you can hear me okay. I'm going to check my Facebook page and make sure that we are indeed live really quickly and make sure that, yep, there we go. And make sure we're live on YouTube. Just checking. And yes, we are. Okay, awesome. So today we're working on the Praxis Core test. This is a free webinar. I do these webinars on Saturday to help people with their exams. Today we'll be focusing solely on the Praxis Core. So as you guys come in, just let me know in the chat if you can hear me and see me okay. Good morning, guys. People are starting to come in. Awesome. Um, I had a little trouble with the link um, and we had to fix it from private to public. So hopefully everybody can click that link and get in no problem. Remember, this is live right now, but it is going to be recorded. So if there are any issues, you know, your internet goes down, my internet goes down, whatever, we will be able to access this afterwards. And once the webinar is over, you're going to receive an email from me about 30 minutes after we um, we're done. And it's going to have an offer code in it, all of the information, any extra stuff I talk about in the webinar and all of that. So I have my colleague Yana in the chat with me today. She's going to be helping us answer any questions because while I'm working, it's hard for me to answer questions. So please ask all the questions you want in the um, chat. We will be focusing again solely on the Praxis Core. I know a lot of people have other questions about other exams and um, today we'll focus just on the Praxis Core, but you can always email us info at KathleenJasper.com. We will help you in any way that we can. Um, and I'm so glad that you guys are here with me today. So we have a bunch of people in and I can see people are from New Jersey. Um, looks like everybody can hear me okay. And um, you guys can talk amongst yourselves and all of that. If you wanna share information or if you have an answer to a question somebody asks, please feel free to do that. So thank you again for joining me today. I know it's Saturday, you guys are probably tired. Many of you are brand new teachers and you need a break. So we're gonna go through this. I'm not gonna go through every little thing on the exam, obviously, because this is a huge test, but I am gonna give you the basics, the structure, and we're gonna go over some problems um, that you're gonna see on the exam or similar to what you will see on the exam. Periodically, I'm gonna share my screen with you because I'm gonna actually work the problems out on my presentation. And then of course, you're gonna receive all of this in a follow-up email. Now, if you registered for the actual webinar and you're in the chat inside the webinar, you received a free study guide for the Praxis Core. And so we're gonna work through some of those problems and um, you'll also get an offer code inside the uh, chat. And that offer code is, let me just put it in here. All right. There we go. That's going to give you 20% off anything that we talk about today. All right. So let me just share my screen really quickly with you guys so that we can um, see exactly what we're working from here. So let's go right here. So when you registered for the webinar, you got a link to the live webinar and you also got the free study guide and it looks like this. Now, this is just an abbreviated study guide. It's not the whole thing. Um, we have a much bigger study guide. I'm going to show you that in a minute, but we're going to be working from this today. So, I'm not going to go too much in depth in the reading because for the reading we have to read and that's really tough to do on a live webinar. Um, but I am going to give you some strategies and things like that. Then we're going to move into the writing portion, which is multiple choice, but also we're going to work on the essay. And I do have two essays for you today that we're going to talk about. We're going to talk about the argumentative essay and we're going to talk about the source-based essay. And I have two of those I'm going to share with you today. And then we're going to get into a little bit of the math. I chose some of the harder problems um, for the math 
because the math on this is tough. And if you're a career changer, meaning you've been working as an accountant or as a real estate agent or something else, and you've decided now you want to be a teacher, you may not, well, if you were an accountant, you probably won't have any problem with the math, but let's say you were something else. Um, you're, this math, you might not have seen this math in a really long time. So you're going to have to brush up on some skills here. The Praxis Core is similar to an ACT. And so that's not an easy test. And so it's important that we prepare. And so we'll go over some math problems there. But this is the free study guide you received when you signed up for the webinar. And um, of course, we have a, a big study guide. And that looks like this here. And you can see, oops, I am a little bit further ahead. Um, this is the table of contents. And you can see that study guide is over 450 pages with multiple practice tests and things like that. So um, you can see that in every section, let me just go to the math section here. In every section of my book, I always put the blueprint and I always use, well, this is going to be your formula sheet that you're going to get on the math, but then I always put in the test specifications because for me, the test specs are the most important part of understanding this test. And so what I do is I grab these headings here and I fill in all the information under that so that you can see everything that you need to know. So I take the specs, I use them as headings, and then I fill up those that information all underneath the specs. So there's a lot here. And as you can see, when we get down to, I mean, there's so many practice problems for the math because I feel like people struggle the most with the math in my experience, but then we have tons of practice tests here with very detailed answer explanations. So if you're looking for something more, um, you can always click this link in your digital study guide. We added this here and it'll take you, let me share this screen here. I just went out, so hang on. This is... Um, there we go. When you click that link, it'll take you to this study guide here. Um, and you can also get it on Amazon if you prefer a physical study guide. So we sell the digital on our website and we sell the physical on Amazon. So um, it just depends on what you want. The digital is all linked up so you can click around in it, but some people want a physical study guide. So this here, and you can see we've got tons of five-star ratings. This book has helped a lot of people. Now beyond that, we also have, let me just go to here. Um, let me share this tab and say, under our programs on my website, kathleenjasper.com, if you go to Praxis Core under our programs here, this is a giant landing page with a lot of information for you. It's got blogs. It has free resources. There's even a thing here for you to sign up for the, the webinar, which you're in already. So you don't have to sign up for that. But there are blogs and things like that. And then we have all of the... Um, the books here and the online courses. Now, the online courses are very comprehensive. They have videos for every problem in the math and the writing. There are um, uh, sample essays and you get the book with the online course. And you can use that offer code I put in the chat in order to get that. And you'll get that offer code in an email as well. And if you want to have a look at what these courses look like. This is just the math. So you can see you get the um, digital study guide here. You can download it there. And then in every part, we have you know the problems online. So you can get used to doing these online. But we also have video explanations for every single problem in the study guide. So if you're somebody who struggles with math and you need more, I highly recommend this. We also have it for you know, the writing as well. I have, you know, lots and lots of videos on the language skills and things like that. Each, you know, you go through here, there's a video for every single skill. So if you're struggling with grammar and all of that, that will help you there. So the online courses are big. You're going to need some time to go through them. Maybe you're just a study guide person and you want just the study guide. That is an option. And maybe you're trying to save money and you just want to use the free stuff. Plenty of people use our free stuff and do great. So it's just up to you. All right. So I just wanted to kind of show you guys that. And um, 
make you understand that there's more than just this short webinar. Okay. All right. I love the pink book. I'm so glad, Melanie. Thank you so much. I went with pink because every other test company had like yellow or blue and I wanted it to stand out. So I went with hot pink and people always say, get the pink book, get the pink book. So it, it worked out. All right. Um, I love the webinar because I'm studying for the test. Thank you. Thank you for attending. Um, dyslexic and terrified of the writing exam. Okay. So if you have um, some sort of exceptionality, maybe you're dyslexic or something else, you can apply for accommodations. And what I will do is I'll put that in the email that I send out to you. So number one, accommodations. Um, I will send a link. If you have been diagnosed with something like that, you can ask ETS for accommodations and they'll give you extra time or whatever. But it takes time to get those accommodations. They don't just give them out. So you're going to have to... Um, to kind of work on that. But uh, there are resources for you out there. I'm going to put the link to the main landing page that I showed you guys. So if you want more information, my mouse is messed up. If you want more information, you can go to this page. And don't forget, this is the offer code for 20% off. Um, and you'll also get that in an email, okay? Will this help with the reading praxis? It will. I'm going to go over strategies for the reading, but because this is a live webinar, I'm not going to do reading online. It's just too difficult to do in a live webinar setting, but I am going to talk to you about strategies, okay? Um, awesome. Oh, you take the test next Saturday. Awesome. Emily, um, my diagnosis is 40 years old. That's okay, Heather. If you've been diagnosed as dyslexic, then you can go to a doctor and have that have a doctor's note they do need proof um but you can it's it's going to take a little bit of energy on your part to get these accommodations but i highly recommend you do that because you have to advocate for yourself just like you would tell your students to advocate for themselves so i highly recommend you go through the process in order to get that that way you can be successful because we all need you know a little something a little extra help here and there in order to pass so that's all good all right, so let's get started. So what is the Praxis Core? The Praxis Core is a, ba it's called a basic skills exam. And in the exam, it is, uh, you're going to have reading, reading comprehension, you are going to have writing, and you are going to have math. Now, this is different than the other tests you take as a teacher. This test is all about doing the skills. There aren't going to be any teacher, teacher scenario questions. You might get an essay about teaching, but this is like if you were to sit down and take an ACT or an SAT. This is not about teaching. They are measuring your basic skills. Now, one thing to keep in mind is that the, this test is based on what a 10th grader has to do in order to pass their exam for graduation. So in, in a lot of states, students start taking their high school equivalency test. We call it, it used to be called the FSA in Florida. Every high school has it where they have to take reading, math, and writing. Many of them have to take a civics exam as well, stuff like that. But the skill level on this exam is about 10th grade. And so it is the position of many states that they want their, their teachers to have the same skills as they require 10th graders through 12th grade for graduation. And so I understand... Um, it can be very frustrating because you're like, I want to teach kindergarten. Why do I have to do this math? I understand how that feels, but it's the position of the states for the most part that they want their teachers to have the same skills as a 10th grade student in American public schools. So try to just get over it and do your best to pass. So we're going to get you through it. Don't worry. Another thing, if you were not successful the first time on your exam, that's okay. Fewer than 50% of test takers are successful their first time on their exams. These are very difficult tests. So um, you will, you might, you most likely will have to take the exam more than once. You might pass one section or two sections and have to go back and take the third section. Remember, it is one giant test, but it is 
um, sectioned out by subtests. So if you pass the reading and the English or the writing, I should call it, it's not called English, it's called writing, the reading and the writing, um, you don't have to take those again. You just have to take the math. So just remember that it is sectioned out into individual subtests, you do have to pass all three subtests to fulfill the requirement, but you do not have to retake anything once you've passed it, okay? Um, in Michigan, I passed in 2004, my school would not count my scores. Well, typically scores are good for 10 years, but if your district is saying no, then you know it is a state-by-state -state thing. Remember guys, the, the policies in education are left to the state. So what's happening in Maryland, what's happening in New Jersey, what's happening in Florida, it can vary. So it's very important you check with your State Department of Education website, all right? Okay, so it looks like we're good. I'm going to start my presentation now. So get out your um, study guide. If you do not have it, don't worry. Just follow along. I'm going to project everything on the screen. So no worries. I just want to make sure I have my screen ready to go here. And I do. So let me go ahead and share my screen with you guys. I hope you all are not too stressed about this exam. All right, so here's my Praxis Core webinar. This is the same thing as in your free study guide. I label them. So like, for example, this question here is number one in the study guide. This question here is number three. You know, I, I hop around a little bit, but I, I added the numbers so you know where I am, okay? And today we're gonna be going through all three sections of the exam. Now I'm gonna talk about the reading and uh, by looking at the actual study guide, because I'm not gonna read to you on the screen. That would be the most boring webinar ever, but let's go ahead and have a look at the reading portion here. So for the most part, you will get a passage and questions. Now, those questions are going to have anything to do with central idea or main idea, key idea and details, inference, it could be anything. Now, my number one strategy for this is to always read the questions first. Now on the exam, they have certain software. I don't have that same software. It's proprietary. They, they have the passage on the left-hand side and the questions on the right-hand side. And usually you scroll through the passage and you can see the questions on the right-hand side. This is very helpful because your questions are over here. I recommend looking at the questions first. Don't get too uh, involved in the answer choices because there are four incorrect answer choices and one correct answer choice, unless they tell you to choose all that apply and you will get those. But for the most part, there's one correct answer, right? So why read the answer choices and fill your brain up with four incorrect answers? But the most important part is the question stem here. So I always talk about working backwards on the exam. You most definitely want to do that on the reading. You wanna read the question first quickly and then go in and read this. Well, why do I do that? Well, if I start up here and start reading this, blah, 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 and I go down and I read the whole thing and then I read the question, I now have to go back and reread to figure out what, you know, what happened with the question. So I highly recommend you go in and read the question first. If there are two questions listed, you can also click through the questions um, on the right hand side. It'll allow you to click through the questions. I would go and read all the questions for the passage that you're given. So this is passage one, right? Maybe there are three questions for passage one. Just quickly read through the questions, maybe even use your scratch paper to jot them down. Just a quick little guide to jot them down so they're in your head. So as you're reading, you might go, oh, this is this is important. I remember that from the question. Let me see if I can answer that really quick. We don't want to just be blindly reading this and hoping for the best when we get to the questions. So always work backwards. Questions first, read the passage, answer the questions. And so uh, and also make sure that you are just reading the questions for that passage that you're reading. You don't want to go through the whole test and read all the questions and then you have to go back and reread. Just if you're on passage one and there are three questions for that passage, read those questions first, then read passage one, answer the questions. Then go to passage two, read all the questions you can for that, 
then um, read the passage. Some passages will only have one question. Other passages might have six, eight questions. It all depends on the, the passage, okay? So this is what it'll look like. They're usually about, I'm sorry, they're usually about this long. Some of them are longer. I have a lot of different ones in my um, study guide. We have some here for the uh, free study guide, but I also have much more complex questions in the paid study guide as well. Now, there is one other thing you can do if you are struggling with the reading. And I know some people were talking in the chat about being dyslexic and, and struggling with the reading portion. All right. Let me show you something you can do for that. Let me stop sharing. Okay. So you can go get... Um, released ACT passages. Okay. So I'm working on the ACT with my daughter. ACT is my jam. I, that's one of my best tests. I know that test like the back of my hand. I used to prep high school kids for it and we would get like awesome scores. But the thing about ACT is they release so many practice tests and, um, they are, uh, they are, full of information and extra passages. So let me show you something really quick here. Let me, let me go to, let me share my screen here. I'm going to show you how to get free passages so that you can, um, practice. Okay. So if you Google released ACT, uh, tests, you can see that there are a bunch of, um, blogs that people write for this. ACT also releases it, but this guy here, this prep scholar guy, I don't know him and we're not affiliated or anything like that, but he has a bunch of release ACT tests and you can see here full length ACT tests, right? So here's the printable ACT. Let me share this. Oops. And you have to put in your name and everything. So let me just put the, uh, let's see here, put this in student Florida 2023. Okay. Submit. So once you get to this, you can see that this is like a real test. This is why I like ACT as a company. I know they're a testing company. So they, a lot of people think that they are maybe a little evil, but um, they have great tests. Their tests are straightforward and you can use this test to practice. Notice section one is the English. So let's say you bought my study guide and you work through all the practice tests and you're like, I always get uh, emails. I need more practice tests. This, this is the English section. This is all grammar. This is all the same stuff you're assessed on the Praxis Core. Now let's go to the reading section. Let's go here. Uh, this is passage two, sorry. There are um, four reading passages here with 10 questions. And I believe the ACT is a teeny bit harder than the Praxis Core. So if you can, you know, work through these reading passages and answer them correctly, um, you can definitely do well on the Praxis Core. So if you're looking for more reading passages and you want that um, to practice with, released ACT, and I will send you the link to this so that you can get it, um, released ACT tests are the way to go. Now, there are even more released ACT tests online that people post. It's I'm not going to share those here because that's I like to go through ACT, but if you hunt, you can find a lot of old ACT tests online with lots of reading passages here. So I highly recommend that you do that if you are struggling with the reading. The second thing to know about the reading is that it is a skill, a muscle that you have to work at and you're going to have to practice. There is no silver bullet with the reading. Like with the writing, I can show you all the rules for grammar and I can increase your score no problem. I can help you increase your score no problem. Even the writing portion, I can give you a formula to use and you can kind of practice that formula for your writing and probably pass the writing with enough practice. With the reading, it's not like that. You have to practice your reading. So I highly recommend if you're struggling with the reading that you do 20 minutes a night in the reading. That's like one reading passage on the ACT and answering the questions or a couple of passages in my book, because mine are a little shorter than the ACT because they mirror the Praxis Core. 
also just reading more and not scrolling, like reading publications like the New York Times, The Economist, they are at a higher Lexile level and they'll help push you. Also, reading those publications will expose you to vocabulary that you are going to see on your reading comprehension test. I can't tell you how often it is when I'm reading a lot, I'm coming to the same vocab all over the place. And it's it's just the more you read, the better you get. So I recommend you do those problems in the free study guide. If you need more help, you can get the paid study guide. I also have an online course where I walk through all of it. But then on top of that, I would carve out 20 minutes a night. And it's not a lot of time. I'm doing it with my daughter right now. We're doing 20 minutes in the reading. And because um, I'm trying to help her with ACT. She's in high school now. So I need her to just work a little bit. Of course, she doesn't want to listen to me, even though I'm the test prep lady. She thinks I don't know anything, <laughs> just the way it is. Um, but we work 20 minutes a night. We do one passage a night, we answer it, and then we go over the questions. It's very important that you understand why you got something right and why you got something wrong. Okay. That's the number one thing about the reading. Let me know in the chat if you have any other questions in the reading. Again, we're not going to go through reading right now because that would be a waste of our time. But free ACT passages, 20 minutes a night, questions first, that's going to save you a lot of time on the reading, and then go in and read strategically, keep practicing those reading skills, all right? All right, so let's go through, let me share my entire screen again, and we're going to start now with the writing. So the reading is the first section of the exam. The reading is uh, the 5713. So you're gonna get that first on the test. The writing is the 5723, and that's what we're gonna do now. Now there's two sections to the writing. There's the multiple choice section where it might look like this here, okay? Where you have to correct the underlined portion of the word or portion of the sentence. You also might have to choose, like all of these answer choices will be long sentences and you have to choose the one that's grammatically correct. It doesn't matter which way it's presented, it's all grammar. So it's really important if you get my big study guide that you read through that because I tell you all of the grammar rules. I also have a grammar playlist on my YouTube channel. I'll show you that at the end. I go through every skill. And then in the online course that I have for this, I go through every single grammar skill. You will be like a grammar genius. Grammar is my favorite thing. I love it. And, um, so I show you all the ways to find it. Grammar is a lot like a mathematical equation. There are rules. People think it's kind of subjective. It's not. It is there are rules to this. And once you figure out the rules, you can gain a lot of points on the multiple choice portion. All right. So let's have a look at number one. This is in your study guide under the writing portion. And you can see that we are going to have to fix the underlying portion of the sentence. So let's have a look. Aunt Judy was happy to see that my mom was sitting with my sister and me. So either this is the error was, this is the error my mom was, me, or there is no error. Okay. So Let's have a look at this. Aunt Judy was happy to see that my mom and my my mom was. So we have was and was. So the the tenses are correct. So I'm going to leave those alone. My mom is right. Someone might say, "Oh, you might have to capitalize the M in mom." No, the M is not. If if I said to see that mom, if I use mom as a proper noun, as in a name, then you capitalize it. But if there's a my in front of it, it's not capital, it's lowercase, okay? So that that one looks fine there. Let me go back here. The, the one that's in question here is my sister and me. So my aunt Judy was happy to see that my mom was sitting with my sister and me. A lot of people think this should be my sister and I, and that is not correct. Me is correct. Why? Because me is the direct object. And people do this all the time when they're speaking. They'll say something like, um, my sister went to the store with Kim and I. No, you don't say my sister went to the store with I. You say my sister went to the store with me. 
Um, my mom was sitting with me, not my mom was sitting with I. One way to figure this out is take out the other person and see which one works better, me or I. In this case, I is not correct. It's me. So there is no error in this sentence. It is written correctly. But I can't tell you how many people want to change that me to I. And I think it comes down to when we were taught as kids, uh, if you said, mom, can me and Kathy go to the store? And your mother would say, who? Me and Kathy, who? And you would say, Kathy and I, can Kathy and I go to the store? And we had that like, that I put into our mind instead of saying me and Kathy, me and Kathy. Well, me is correct when it's in the direct object part of the sentence or the predicate of the sentence. My mom is the subject. I is a subject pronoun. So is he, she, they, who, those are all subject pronouns. They belong in the subject, but me, them, him, her, us, whom, those are all direct objects and they belong in the predicate of the sentence. All right. So number one, no error. This is a tricky one. You'll see these on the exam. Let's go with the next one here. This is number three in your free study guide. All right. She is constantly checking her work ensuring she doesn't make any errors. So right away, you can see that we have a period here and a capital E here. And all we have here is a verb phrase. This is a fragment. This is not correct. You do not, you can't do a whole sentence using a fragment. Ensuring that should be off. She doesn't make any errors. Um, ensuring she doesn't make any errors is a verb phrase. So in this case, you would just need a comma because a comma can separate an independent clause and a dependent clause. Well, what's an independent clause and a dependent clause? An independent clause can stand on its own and um, be you could put a period at the end and a capital letter in the beginning, and it could be a sentence. So let's have a look here. She is constantly checking her work. That is an independent clause. Ensuring she doesn't make errors is a dependent clause. I'm sorry about this uh, word here. Just ignore it. I'm going to fix it, but that should not be there. Um, that's a dependent clause. And it can stay, but it does not, it can't stand on its own. So you can't make it a sentence. So instead we can put the comma there and separate this independent clause and the dependent clause. And that would be correct. So B would be the best answer. Okay. Well, let's eliminate a few more. Let's talk about the semicolon here. All right. A lot of people are confused about semicolons. Semicolons. Let me erase this so I could. Semicolons separate two independent clauses. Okay. So it has to be basically two sentences on each side. So for example, she is constantly checking her work and maybe the next part is, um, she wants to ensure she doesn't make any errors, right? Then I could use a semicolon. A semicolon separates two independent clauses and you don't need a capital letter after the semicolon. It's a lowercase letter. Also, never, never, never semicolon and semicolon, but semicolon. So just say no to this on the test. You do not need a conjunction uh, between the semicolon and the second independent clause. You just need the semicolon. The semicolon is like a period. It's just that we use it so it's not such an abrupt stop. And both of these clauses are related when we use a semicolon. All right. So C is out because ensuring she doesn't make any errors is a dependent clause. And this would be incorrectly separating a dependent and an independent. That doesn't work. Now, if we don't do anything there, let's say there's no comma, no nothing. That's a run on because then we have an independent clause and a dependent clause all running together without any punctuation. And so D would be a run on and that doesn't work. A is a fragment because we broke it up incorrectly with a period, but D with nothing would be a run on. And E doesn't make sense. You're adding more stuff. Here's one thing to know about English tests and grammar exams. The answer choice with the fewest amount of words is usually the correct answer. This is especially true on the ACT. If you have these long answer choices and then you have one with very few words, 
slow down and look because brevity is a part of grammar. You want to say what you want to say without using a bunch of words. And so if you see a very short answer choice, that could be the correct answer. Slow down and have a look. I'm not saying 100% of the time, but that could be the correct answer there. Okay. So a couple people were talking to me in the chat about being, let me stop sharing here really quickly. Let me go back to here. A couple people in the chat were saying that they struggle with, um, with being dyslexic or writing, you know, or maybe you, um, maybe your, English is not your first language and you're really scared about the writing part. Cause it's hard to write two full essays in 30 minutes, one essay in 30 minutes and another essay in 30 minutes. It's hard if you, if English is your first language, it's especially difficult if English is not your first language. If I went to Argentina right now or Colombia and they asked me to write a essay in uh, Spanish or Portuguese, um, I think Argentina, I don't know, correct me if I'm wrong. I know Brazil is Portuguese. I'm not sure if Argentina is Portuguese. I just don't want to assume. Sorry about that. But let's say in another language, okay? I have a doctorate in education. I write all the time. I am a writer. I have books on Amazon that I sell. If I went to Colombia and they said, write this essay in our home language, not your home language, I would fail it. So this is really, really difficult. So um, one way you can fix that is getting as many questions right on the multiple choice grammar section. So if the actual writing of paragraphs is not your strong suit, really work hard on the grammar so that you can get as many points as possible. That way, if you flake out a little bit on the writing, the, the grammar from the multiple choice will push that score up. For the writing exam, the essay and the multiple choice are scored together. You still have to get some points on the writing, but you can. You could get a two or a three, maybe a three. A three would be best, and then get a lot of um, extra points on that grammar section. So really try hard to learn the grammar skills you need so that you can find errors. Because I know grammar so well, I can take any test, ACT, SAT, um, anything with grammar, and I can nail it because I know the rules. It's second nature. So really get to know um, that, and that'll help you bump it up, all right? So now we are actually going to talk about the writing section. Let's have a look at that really quickly. Let me share my screen. Now let's go with the writing, okay? So I have a lot of videos on this. We're gonna do this today, obviously. I'm gonna walk you through it. I'm even gonna send you this in the email. I'm gonna send you these essays so you can see them in the email so you can watch this back again later and you can um, you know, write your own essay and check it. I highly recommend when you are writing for these essays that you... Um, you practice. I have about 10 argumentative prompts in my book, so you can use them, but you can also use the same prompt over and over and just write it to it differently. There are lots of ways you can do this. Okay. So here's the argumentative essay here. All right. This is what it's going to look like. Now I can't guarantee what prompt you're going to get because, you know, let me zoom in. Let's see if I can zoom in a little bit more here. Hopefully you guys can see that a little better. Um, but you're going to get one argumentative essay and one source-based essay that's going to look like, where's my source-based? Hang on. Did I lose it? Oh, it's in the actual study guide. We'll talk about it in a second. I didn't want to put it on the presentation. I'll show it to you inside the study guide. So the first one's going to be the argumentative essay, and you're going to get something like, this, which is a very, um, a very, uh, oh gosh, intense, a very opinionated statement. It's going to say the only important criterion by which to judge persp a prospective teacher is his or her ability to get along with students. Notice this is a very one-sided argument. Most people would not argue this, that it's the only way, right? Um, but on the test, it's going to be, uh, this kind of definitive. This is the only way it's going to use this strong language here. And that way it's, 
in a lot of ways, it's going to be easy for you to disagree with it. All right. Now you might agree with this. If that's the case, go for it. And whether you agree or not, I recommend you write to the perspective that's easiest for you. All right. In my case, it's easier for me not to agree with this because I think there's a lot more that goes into judging a prspective teacher than just whether or not um, he or she uh, gets along with students, right? So, but the first thing I want to do is determine in my head, do I agree or do I disagree? One thing you do not want to do is say, I kind of agree and I kind of disagree. No. We're not having a philosophical conversation about this. We are taking an, an exam and you only have 30 minutes to write this essay. So we're not going to go wishy-washy. You're going to pick a side and you're going to stay on that side. Because if you start going in and out of your argument and you're like, I kind of agree, I kind of don't agree, you're taking up time and now your essay is going to be hodgepodgey and messy and incoherent and you're going to lose points. So pick a side. No one's going to judge you for it. Just pick any side, yes or no. I'm going to say, no, I don't agree with this right away. Okay. And of course, here is my task. Your task is always going to be the same on this. So you don't even really have to read it. I mean, you could just um, look at it very quickly. Discuss the extent to which you agree or disagree. Support your position with, here's the key here, specific reasons and examples from your own experience. Now, this is graded from a one, two, three, four, five, or six. Six is the highest. One is the lowest. You don't need a six. A four will get you there. A three will get you there if you did really well on the multiple choice. So we're not trying to write the the next great American author or American uh, masterpiece here. We are just trying to do the task. So what we need to do is, do we agree or disagree? And it, whichever way we go, we need to give specific reasons and examples from your own experience. When we say examples from your own experience, that means you can use first person narrative if you want. In fact, the sample essays on the Praxis Core study companion have I in them, me, we. That's first person narrative. Okay. So um, I'm going to show you that in a second, but this is going to be more of I am giving my opinion. I can say I. It's not a third person narrative where we keep, you know, I, me, we out of it. All right. So there are basically three things we have to do. Agree or disagree. Use, uh, use specifics to support and draw from our own personal experience. Well, what might that look like? You can see here right away. I say, I disagree here. Okay. That is, and I'm going to stay that way. All right. Now, the way I write this essay is I actually write this part first. This is what I call the details paragraph. This is where the specifics are going to be. This is where the bulk of the essay is graded. So let's have a look at that. I'm going to go to the intro later. When I write, I always write the detail paragraphs first because the intro is really hard to write. Um, like start from scratch and just start from the intro. I always write the intro and the conclusion last. So let's have a look at this paragraph here. In high school, I had an English teacher who was notorious for being difficult to deal with. I, along with others, found him abrasive and stuffy. Okay. So I'm giving you my personal experience. Then I say he certainly wasn't getting along with most of his students. Okay. We found his teaching style. Here's the specifics to be outdated and boring. He demanded diagramming sentences, more specific details, rewriting paragraphs over and over, proofread constantly. However, during my freshman year of college, I quickly realized that because of him or my English teacher, my knowledge of grammar, punctuation, and structure was far beyond my classmates. Notice I'm giving my experience and I am giving specific details. I'm talking about diagramming sentences, proofreading, grammar and punctuation, going to college, being above my classmates. And it says, it turns out my English teacher prepared me to be successful, even though he was easily the least popular teacher. So you can see here that I give you my perspective, but I also back it up with specifics. The biggest mistake I see people do when they write their essays is they don't use any specifics. They use abstractions. Things like, I had a very difficult teacher in high school. He didn't get along with, with anybody. Most students dropped out of his class. Many um, 
many parents complained about him. Those are all larger ideas. Well, why? Show me. Don't tell me. Show me. When when I see diagramming sentences, proofreading constantly, and being successful in college, I can see the story. You're not just telling me. So you can say right here, difficult to deal with. That's an abstraction, and it's okay to start with that, but then we got to get down to the nitty gritty. I'm going to go over this even more in the source-based essay. So now what I want to do is go to my intro. I've got my bulk. And the thing is, the reason why I wrote the details, let's say that I ran out of time. At least I have this. Because if I look at this, this one paragraph here, it meets all the... Um, it meets all the classifications. All I have to do is say, I disagree that prospective teachers need to, um, I could just grab this solely on getting along with students. I could put that sentence and attach it to here and write a one paragraph essay and I would be fine. You would get probably a four or maybe even a five because it checks all the boxes. Now I'm choosing to give you an intro and a conclusion here, but it's not necessary to get the points you need. That's why just write your details paragraph. And then if you're running out of time, just put above it, I disagree with the idea that and whatever the idea is, or it might be agree. I agree that blah, blah, blah. It depends on what your prompt is. All right, let's have a look at the intro just so you can see. I disagree with the idea that prospective teachers should be judged solely on whether they get along with students. It is more important for teachers to be experts in their content area. For example, here we go into more specifics. A biology teacher must have detailed understanding of topics like cell division, osmosis, photosynthesis. Notice how specific I got there. I'm talking about the, I'm not just talking about biology. I'm talking about subjects within biology. And then I'd use another example. Similarly, English teachers must have thorough academic understanding of grammar specific, structure specific, composition, literature. Notice that there's a little bit of um, main idea or abstraction, and then we get more specific as we move on. Now, you do not need this at the end. You do not need a conclusion. I put it here just because some of you may ask, but it's basically just a wrapping up or a summary of what I just wrote. Being an effective teacher is not a popularity contest. Teachers must be experts in their fields and be able to give students the information they need to be successful. Although it is super helpful for a teacher to be well-liked, that is not the only quality that it uh, takes to be effective. Again, there might be some mistakes in here. I might have a little grammar issue. That's okay. You're not going to get docked a million points. Now, if it's incoherent and let me stop sharing here so I can um, see what you guys are asking. If it's incoherent, your grammar is really bad. You're going to get docked. All right. So just keep that in mind. All right. Um, let's see. I got to scroll down here. I'm scoring high on the essays, but the multiple choice is hard for me. Emily, good news. If the multiple, if you're scoring high on the essay, all you have to do is learn the rules of grammar. So I'm going to show you, I have a grammar playlist, the study guide. I also go through that and the online course, I go through it specifically. You'll never be confused about grammar again. And you will like be hearing people talk and you'll be correcting their grammar. You'll be like, oop, that's incorrect. Oh, that's incorrect. You'll be looking at people's emails and going, mm, not correct. So just bear with me, go to my YouTube channel. I'm going to show you at the end where to get that. And also if you want more help, I have an online course and the study guide has all those rules in it, but you might need a demonstration. So either the YouTube channel or my online course will help you there. Um, Emily, I feel like this was one of my praxis prompts. It might have been. I think I got it from um, from uh, the study companion. So, all right. <clears throat> okay, so some people are talking about 12 to 14 good on both essays. I just told you you could get a one through a six, right? Why are um, people getting 12s and 14s and things like that? The reason is, is because you have two essays and they're graded by two graders. So, it's really out of 24 points. Here's why. Essay number one, you can get a one through six, but there are two graders. So each grader is giving you a one through six. So they do it out of 12. So you're going to want to be at like an eight out of 12, six, six out of 12 is only 50%. That means each grader gave you a three, three plus three is six. 
somebody's asking a 14 is, is, um, th that it's not great, but it'll work. So if we have 24, the next essay is another six plus six, 12. So the whole thing, both essays is 24. So I would recommend 16 out of 24, 18 out of 24 to put you in the solid zone. That means you're getting fours, excuse me, fours from each grader. You're getting a four from grader one, four from grader two on um, essay one. That's eight. Then a four from grader one, four from grader two on essay two. That's eight. That's a 16 out of 24. Okay. That's a little more than 50% correct. Um, an 18 out of 24 is good. That's great, but you're going to need, you're going to need that multiple choice. You know, you got to, you got to hit that multiple choice. The multiple choice is worth 75% of the writing and the writing is worth 25% of the writing. So you can't just bomb the writing. You need the score. It's a, it's a big bulk of the score, but they combine it. Um, but you do need to get better at the multiple choice if you're having a hard time with that. All right. All right, let's talk quickly about the source space and then I'm going to get into the math. All right, so let me go here. All right, source based. Oh, you know what? Let me go here so I can show you what the source based is going to look like. Okay, so here it is here. You're going to have some sort of, they call it an assignment. Um, and it's basically going to give you a scenario usually it's a current event, something like that. I, I, it could be a lot of things. Okay. I don't know. They have a million prompts and we're not supposed to know. It doesn't matter. Right? So this is the thing here. Read the two passages carefully and write an essay in which you identify the most uh, concerns. Your essay must draw from both of the sources and you must cite the sources. Okay. People think this is the hardest essay. I find this essay to be the easiest because you're not building your own opinion, you're actually summarizing what somebody said. This is actually easier. I'm going to show you how. So before I read this and the other one, I'm first going to get the overarching topic. And in this case, it's about AI. And it's basically saying artificial intelligence is progressing. Um, some AI is, is portrayed as robots with human-like things. AI also encompasses Google search algorithms. So this is just like a kind of a overarching understanding of AI. And then it says some people like it, and some people may think that it's going to destroy our society. So we have two contrasting sides. And then what you want to do is you want to look at the titles of these sources. Don't just read this whole thing. You know how long it's going to take you to read this? That's going to, that's taking valuable time. Then you got to read the second one. You don't want to do that. What you want to do first is look at the title and see if you can glean any information. This one says, is, artifi is artificial intelligence dangerous? Six AI risks everyone should know. All right. This tells me that Mar this author here is a little apprehensive about AI. They're saying it's risky. Okay. This one, MIT technology review, AI as a force for good. So we have two opposing uh, views. MIT, which is Massachusetts Institute of Technology, which technology is, is good, according to MIT. AI is a force for good. And then here we have AI is bad, six risks. Okay. So right away, I know that I have two opposing views. I recommend you map this essay. So on your scratch paper, you're going to have something that looks like this. Mar, AI is bad. MIT, AI is good. Now, I don't want you to necessarily go in and read the entire thing. You just need enough information to summarize. So I know right away, Mar, the author Mar is bad AI, AI is bad, and MIT AI is good. Now I just need a couple of specifics to back up what Mar is saying and MIT is saying. All right, so let's go back. Um... If I go in here, and let me zoom in for you guys, because this is probably really tiny on the screen. Let me close this. Hopefully you can see that a little bit better. All right. So 
this is the AI is dangerous one. Okay. So we have, um, super intelligent machines. Uh, what dangers they, have, let me go say, Oh, here's a bad word. Autonomous weapons might gain a mind of their own. Once deployed, sorry, my mouse, once deployed, they may make it difficult to dismantle or combat. Okay. That sounds problematic. I don't like that. Right. So let's go ahead and put that under Mar AI is bad. Autonomous weapons. Machines don't value human life. Okay. There's one detail I can put in my essay. Let's go find one more. Here's one. Collect, track, and analyze. Uh, cameras nearly everywhere. Facial recognition. China's social credit system. All right. So tracking, analyzing sounds like uh, citizens' rights are being um, infringed on by using AI. Okay. So that's enough there. Tracking privacy can be used to prosecute people for crimes. All right. I didn't even have to read the whole thing. Now I know this, this passage cause it's mine, but, um, you can do the same thing. You do not have to read every little thing. You just need enough to, um, make a, a tiny paragraph. Okay. Now let's go to MIT. AI is good. Scroll down. I need two good things from MIT. Sorry. All right. Okay. So it's gaining the attention. Let me go down here. Oh, look here. AI programs can improve student outcomes, adjust to their learning needs, resulting in tailor-made curriculum. Okay. Improving student gains, learning, respond to needs. Okay. Student learning. I got that as AI is good. Perfect. Now I need another one. Okay. Look, hospitals, healthcare, um, AI is being used to collect advanced information, um, targeted consultations. Um, there was something in here also about follow-up monitoring patients, um, leading to shorter and more targeted consultations. Okay. It's improving hospitals, improving healthcare. Let me go over here. Medical pre-diagnosis that saves doctors time. Okay, perfect. So now I have, I can make a paragraph out of these two for AI is bad. And I can make a paragraph out of these two where AI is good. All right. Well, let's have a look at what that looks like. Remember, let me, I, I want to make this bigger for you guys. See if I can text. Uh, what's 40 look like? Is that better? Yeah, that's better. But let me get rid of this. Sorry, I want it to be a little bigger so you guys have a better. If you're watching on the phone, it's going to be hard to see that. Okay. So we have um, these two detailed paragraphs. Now, I could, if I were in a jam, I could just do this and still probably get a four, I think, because I do all the things. I've summarized MAR and I've summarized MIT. I've also cited, this is how I cite for this essay. People are like, how should I cite MLA, APA? I choose APA because it's easier than MLA. All you do is have the last name and the date of the publication. All right. So remember, Mar says AI is bad. The author Mar, and it was written in 2018. It's in the title of the thing. So that's all I have to do. So here I go. Mar asserts AI can be dangerous. And the time is now to determine how dangerous this technology could be. Mar 2018 argues that AI can be used as autonomous weapons, develop a mind of their own. Notice I have little quotes there. I am citing directly from the article. Here we go again. In addition, Mar 2018 states that AI can be fixed to track, collect, analyze people, which puts them in danger. Here's this word. For example, getting into more specific details, face recognition, cameras, algorithms, specifics here can be used to oppress citizens. Here we go again. In fact, Mar 2018 cites China's social credit system. Another specific example. And then I added this. This goes against the basic principle of American independence. That's mine. All right. But notice I have, I cited Mar here. I cited Mar here. I cited him here. I cited him there. So 
that's all you need is the last name and the date. You could also say, according to an article written by Marr in 2018, but that takes too much time. I like to just do APA, last name, uh, date. Now, if I chose to put it at the end of the sentence, like we did here um, for the MIT, notice that my citation is at the end of the sentence. It's in this one, there's no last name, MIT published the article. So it's MIT comma 2018. But let's say that this particular sentence was Mar. I could do Mar comma 2018 parentheses, period. Period goes outside the parentheses. Your citations do not have to be perfect. They just want you to cite. I'm just giving you an easy way to cite. Okay. And in this case, I've done all the things they asked me to do. All right. Now, here we go in here. Conversely, MIT released an article in 2018 that praises AI. Um, one way AI can be used positively is student outcomes. Okay, that's kind of general. Let's get more specific. For example, AI can differentiate learning and tailor curriculum based on students' needs. And then I cited because that came from MIT. MIT 2018 shows how AI can be used in hospitals to improve patient outcomes. Also general, patient outcomes, student outcomes, patient outcomes, general. But here we go. For example, AI is being used to collect advanced patient information for basic pre-diagnosis, leading to shorter, more targeted consultations. I could leave it there and be done with it. I would get a four. Now, if you want to add more, hang on, I want to make sure I'm still alive. Okay, I think I'm still alive. My thing kind of went out. Hopefully you guys can see me. Um, all right, if you wanted to add a, an intro to a, and a conclusion, you could add that here. And all I did was summarize the assignment. AI is advancing rapidly. Rap rapidly. Some people believe this while others believe that. The debate about AI is whether it's good or bad is ongoing, okay? I don't need it, but you could put it there if you've got time. And then a conclusion here, which is a summary of what's going on. The benefits and concern around AI are just heating up. This technology is developing every day. You know, uh, AI is integrated into people's lives. Do the pros outweigh the cons? You know, just like whatever, blah, blah. It's, it's fluff. Really, the meat of your grade is going to come from here, right here, okay? All right, let me go back to here. Stop sharing. Let me go to my questions. MTC English. Okay, thank you so much. Do we have an online price score for money back guarantee? I don't do money back guarantees. Um, people are asking about that. I cannot guarantee that you're going to pass the exam. Um, I have a 98% pass rate. People who use our, our materials pass the exam. But, you know, a lot of people feel like, well, I bought the online course, I should pass. It all depends on how much effort you put into it. So I don't do money back guarantees. Um, but you can use it for as long as you need. There is no expiration on our online courses. So if you buy it once, you don't have to keep buying it like other companies. Um, a lot of people say I'm silly for doing that, that I should put a, um, a time frame on it. I don't want to do that because some people need more time. So I don't do money back guarantees, but you can have the course for as long as you need it. Um, what do you do if you have multiple authors? Good question, MT. All you do is list the names, Smith, comma, Jasper, comma, Jones, Ampersand, uh, Jones, uh, Williams, comma, and then the date. You could also do, I have a video about this on TikTok. It's, I'm going to show it to you before the end. Remind me to do the TikTok video. Hang on. Let me put my TikTok up so I remember. I have a TikTok video on citing sources that I will um, help you with. Let me see here. It's going to, I'll show you. It's a really good one. You could also do the first name or the first author last name. So let's say Jasper, comma, E T A L, et al., and then the date. Remember, the citations don't have to be perfect. We are looking for just referencing it. Nowhere in the in the parameters does it say you must have proper APA 
format. It doesn't say that. So you could say according to the first author or according to the last name, you could do that. I'm just showing you because I'm I write research all the time. That's how I cite. Okay, but really good question, MT. I'm going to point you in the direction of my TikTok because I did this video on multiple authors and it's gotten so many views because so many people have that question. So I'll point you there um, before we're, we're done with this. The hardest part is to cite because on the text, it doesn't give you the option to copy and paste. That's okay. Just use the last name and the date. Last name, comma, date. Just, just do it. All right. Uh, my college is assessed with APA in Michigan. Yeah. Well, if you're in this, if you're in uh, the field of teaching, um, APA is going to be like, if you're going to get your master's degree in teaching or in educational leadership or anything in that realm, you're going to be using APA. Does going back and putting an intro or conclusion help with points? It might, but the bulk of it is going to be from those details. So I would say if you had time, do the intro. The conclusion is fluff. But if you have time and once you fixed your details and they're good to go and you have general idea and then specific details, you can go in and put the intro in. Okay. But it's not, it never says how many paragraphs it has to be. Okay. Um, when multiple authors, do you just do it the first time? And then after that, the year after that, it's just the first author. Okay. If it's multiple authors, you, you used to have to list all the authors first Jasper comma Williams comma Smith comma and or Amperstan and uh, Jones 2018. Now APA says you don't, you can just say Jasper et al. I'm going to show you the et al is E T A L, which means all the rest. I'm going to send you in the email, Yana, if you're listening, remind me to put this in there. I'm going to, in the email, I'm going to send you my TikTok video for citing multiple authors. You'll, you'll love it. It'll clear up all this confusion for you. And it's like two minutes. Okay. Okay. I ran out of time when writing this essay. I completed the intro and the two body paragraphs, but not the conclusion. That's okay. I mean, you're, you want to make sure those details have everything in them that you need. All right. Okay. So let's go on to math. Okay. I know we're, I wanted to do this in an hour every time I try and I can't, but that's okay. It's progress, not perfection. Let's talk about the math. Oops, here we go. I'm gonna just do a couple of math problems here um, so that you can see them. And there are lots of different math problems, but I chose some of the harder ones, okay? So this is number eight in your study guide, all right? And this is an example of when you use proportions. Now, proportions are all over a standardized math test. All right, they are constant. So you want to learn proportions. Now let's have a look at this um, question here. A model of a, well, right away, before I read that, I can see this. This is a ratio. As soon as I see a ratio, I'm going to think proportion in my mind. All right, so let's have a look. A model of a statue measures eight inches wide by six inches tall. The scale of inches to feet, very important, inches to feet, used to make the statue is a ratio of two to five. What is the height of the actual statue? Okay, they're asking for the height. They're giving us width and tall, and tall is height. So this is what I need. I don't need the eight inches. This is an example of when they give you, excuse me, extra information. We don't need that, all right? So let's first talk about this ratio. Inches to feet or inches to feet. When we do proportions, we want to make it matchy-matchy. That means we have inches to feet equals inches to feet, or feet to inches equals feet to inches. It doesn't matter which way you do it, but it's got to be, and I call this in on my videos and in my online course, matchy-matchy. Whatever you have on the top, it has to be the same on both sides of the proportion, uh, on both sides of this equal sign. Whatever you have on the bottom, you have to have that, right? Now, let me give myself some room. Let's do this. Matchy, matchy. All right, so my proportion of inches to feet is two to five or 
two over five. That's inches to feet. We're looking at a scale. This is a scale. So if I have a little two inches, I know that equals five feet. They do this with maps. They'll do it with um, statues on the test. It's, it's done a lot with maps, okay? So I have two over five. Now I want to set that equal to what I'm actually measuring, which is this six inch tall thing. Well, I know that it is six inches. So where does the six go? On the top or the bottom? Inches. Where do inches go? Goes on the top. Six. How many feet is that? Well, I don't know. That's where my X goes. So I have inches over feet equals inches over. I'm not sure how many feet it is. I have to do the proportion. When we do the proportion, we cross multiply and solve. And in this case, we get 2X equals 30. Divide by two, divide by two, X equals 15 feet. Now in the book, I have tons of different ways to use proportions. You might have it with similar figures. You might have it in a word problem like so-and-so can make four sandwiches in 15 minutes. How many sandwiches can he make in a full eight hour shift? You're going to have to convert minutes to hours, set up the proportion. Proportions are used all the time. Uh, Ms. Jones uh, sold 60 books in 10 days. How many books will she sell in 45 days? A proportion. You might have similar figures where you have a tree. A tree is in the park and it's 12 feet tall and it casts a shadow that's eight feet tall long. Um, another tree in the park has a shadow of five feet. How tall is the tree? You do it the same way, matchy matchy. So um, proportions are really important. I highly recommend you go through them in the book. I have a lot of videos on YouTube. I also have them in the online course. Make sure you know how to use proportions, okay? I use them all the time to help solve math problems. All right, let's have a look at another one. I wanted to do this one because scatter plots are on the exam and a lot of people are not familiar with scatter plots and they see this and it feels like a very complicated kind of data point, all right? So right away, when I'm looking at um, my questions, I always want to work backwards. In this case, I'm not going to be able to eliminate any answer choices, but I can see that my answer choices are in slope intercept form y equals mx plus b now you might have a mini heart attack because you haven't seen this equation since your 10th grade math class i understand but there's a couple ways you can solve this just by understanding a few things about this equation first off m is your slope that's going to be really important so two is your slope, negative two is your slope, one half is your slope, one half is your slope, negative one half is your slope, all right? That's the first thing. The next thing I wanna look at this line over here. You can see it's a bunch of dots, but which way is it trending? It's trending up. This is a positive slope. That means I can eliminate any negative slopes, which is B and E. If it were negative, it would be going like this, down, like that. All the dots would be going down, and it would be going this way, all right? But that's not happening. We have a positive slope. Let me redo that line really quickly because I'm going to need it. So we have a positive slope. All right, great. Now what? Well, what we can do now, this is what I recommend you do, is you can take a look at the slopes and figure out, is it two over one, which is two, or is it one half? Now, or, remember, when we're looking at slope, we're doing rise over run. That means we're going up and then over, okay? So two over one, let's have a look. Notice these are in increments. Can I zoom in here? Okay, good. These are in increments of two. So I'm, I'm trying to figure out if my slope is two over one first. So let's say I start here at the zero. Up two. Now, I don't go up two lines because that's up four. I only go up one line because there. this is all in twos. Two, four, six, eight, 10, 12. You can see right here going up. So I go up two, 
over one, up two, over one, up two, over one, up two, over one, up two, over one, up two, over one, up two, over one, up two, over one. Notice that it's going in the right direction and it is uh, following that line very closely. So it looks like two over one is my slope or two. Let's just eliminate the one half slope. Let's just see. If it's one half, it means I'm going up one over two, which means, let me erase. If I start at zero, I'm going here because it's in two. So if I'm only going up one, I'm going here, up one over two, up one over two, up one over two, up one over two. Notice where my line is going. It's going this way. So one half is not the slope, which means I can eliminate C and D making A the correct answer. Let me zoom back out here. Oop. All right. So remember, first we want to check and see, is it a positive slope or negative slope? Sometimes there's like one positive slope and the rest are negative and you can quickly eliminate the negatives and be done with it. Okay. But in this case, I wanted to make it a little bit tougher for you. Then we evaluate the slope. We have two or one half, and two is two over one. One, remember, it's rise over one, rise over run. So this is up and over, up two over one, up two over one, and just kind of see with a scatter plot, it's not going to be a perfect line. So um, don't worry about it. Just it's notice that that progression of a two over one slope is the most uh, closest, the closest line on there. All right, now let's have a look at probability because people tend to have agita when they get a probability question. So let's have a look here. Um, I can see right away the word probability. A paper bag contains six red squares, some yellow squares, and eight blue squares. If the probability of selecting a yellow square is five out of 12, how many yellow squares are in the bag? Now be careful, you might be like, oh, it's five. Well, when we talk about probability, we're doing part over whole. And in this case, we're saying the probability is out of 12, which means this is a reduced fraction. Because if I were to add the six and the eight only, I don't know how many yellow I have. I have 14, plus I have some yellows, which means that the whole is gonna be four, more than 14, at least 15. I could have one yellow, I could have two yellow, I don't know. So there's a couple ways to do this. I'm going to show you the proper way, and then I'm going to show you a cheat sheet if you can't remember the proper way, okay? Um, let's go here. So remember, we have part, let me just erase that. We have part over whole. So in this case, let's figure out what we have. We have six red plus some yellow. I don't know what it is, so I'm going to do it as a Y. Plus eight equals 14 plus y, right? Because six plus y plus eight is 14 plus y. This is the total. I have to make sure I factor in that y. All right, well, I have five over 12. We're gonna do a proportion again. Five over 12 is the probability. Well, what's the probability of yellow here? Well, I have part yellow over whole, which is 14 plus y. The whole is 14 plus the yellow that I don't know. And we're looking for yellow. So now what do I do? Same thing I did with the, um, the other pr proportion with the statue. I cross multiply and solve. And in this case, I get 12y equals 70 plus 5y, because I'm basically doing this. 12 times y equals five times 14 plus y. And I'm distributing, okay? Boom, boom. That's what I'm doing there, all right? Now combine like terms and move them around algebra style. I'm gonna subtract five here to get rid of it. Subtract five y here, and I get seven y equals 70. Divide by seven to isolate the y, and I get y equals 10. E D is the correct answer there. Now, Let's say you're like, I get this all the time when I do math online. They're like, there's a shortcut to that. Well, I know there's a shortcut. I'm trying to teach people math. They're like, all you have to do is this. I'm like, yeah, I know, but people need help with the actual math. Anywho, I'm going to give you a shortcut. 
use the answer choices. Let's say you're like, eh, I forget. Okay, so we have 5 over 12 is the reduced fraction here, right? So we know that the uh, that it needs to be set up so that this particular th thing can equal um, can equal uh, the same fraction re reduced, right? Well, if this is a five, wh what are the only wh what are the only numbers that five goes into? Things that end with zero or things that end with five, right? This up here has to be something with a zero or something with a five, because to reduce, you'd have to have that, right? So in this case, um, the only one that has a zero or a five is D, and you could do it that way because this is going to be 10, hang on. The actual thing is 10 over 24. We reduced by two, right? We reduced 10 divided by two is five, 24 divided by two is 12. You could do it that way. In this case, it's easy because you have a five here, all right? But you could just plug in the different, um, the different answer choices. You could say, okay, maybe it's seven. All right, six plus seven is 13 plus eight is 21. 21 over, oh wait, that's the whole thing. Sorry, that's the full. 21 down here, right? Because that's the full. So it would be 7 out of 21. Can I reduce 21 to 12? No, I can't reduce 21 to 12. A is out. What about 8? 6 plus 8 is 14 plus 8 is 22. Can I make 22 go down to 12 if I were going to be reducing the fraction? No, I couldn't. So you could do it that way as well by finding out the whole and figuring out if you could reduce it. But again, I recommend just doing it the right way. Let me review that one more time just in case I confused you guys with this last little bit. What I'm going to do is I'm going to assign my unknown uh, yellow as Y. So we have the whole 6 plus Y plus 8, right? 6 plus Y plus 8 equals 14 plus Y. Now we have part over whole. Y, not sure how many yellow, over 14 plus Y. Well, it's going to equal this because this is the reduced fraction. 5 over 12 cross multiply 12Y equals 70 plus 5y, subtract 5, subtract 5y, and we get uh, 10y equals 70, divide by 10, divide by 10, y equals 7. No, oh, no, 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 sorry, sorry. Just did that wrong. 12 minus 5 is 7y equals 70. Sorry, I was going too fast. Divide by 7, y equals 10. I was right the first time. I shouldn't have redone it. Okay. A little bit of algebra, a little bit of proportions, a little bit of, I don't know, probability. It's all there. Okay. All right. Let me go back to my thing here. All right. We have finished. You guys made it through. I'm way over time. All right. So a lot of people, some of um, Katrina said, I haven't taken the math party. I've never been good at it. And it's been so long. Okay. Katrina, I'm going to tell you what I tell lots of people who say I've never been good at math. No one is inherently good at math. We are taught at a young age, we're either math-brained or English-brained, which is a lie. That is not true. In fact, some of the most uh, like well-known philosophers and artists were mathematicians. I don't know when we started with this, we're either right-brained or left-brained. We're not. We both use both sides of our brain. Try not to tell yourself negative math stories you're still going to have to work on the math skills, but I recommend if you're having a really hard time going through my math online course, one problem at a time and watching the videos as I work through it, you'll get better. You can also go use Khan Academy. That's free. They have a lot of different ones there. I, you're trying to pass the Praxis course, so I recommend getting at least the study guide and working through. But you might not have been successful in math before, but that doesn't mean you can't be awesome at math now. I got so much better at math because I opened a test prep company. I was okay in high school. I was like in honors, but only because like, you know, I wasn't, I wasn't real special at anything in school. I, I got good grades, but I was, I flew below the radar. Um, but later in life is when I got all my academic, you know, 
stuff. But now that I own a test prep company, I have to be good at math because people ask me math questions. So that's how I got better. So just stop telling yourself negative stories about math. Do your best to jump in with an open mind and learn the skills again. These skills are difficult on everybody. So just go in, start it, work on them, analyze the math. There are a lot of people you can follow online. I obviously have a YouTube channel with lots of math, but there are other people as well. And just start to get to get to know it, get comfortable with it. It's it doesn't have to be like this crazy abstract concept. I know we we've been taught, "Oh, you're you're good at English. You must not be good at math." Or, "Oh, you're good at philosophy. You must not like math." Not true. We use both sides of our brains all the time. There is no I'm good at math, not good at something else, all right? Um, do you have any resources in math content that I can buy? Uh, I have a whole math online course and a study guide. So I definitely recommend that it is specific to the Praxis core, but it goes through every single math skill from number sense, um, PEMDAS, orders of operation, fractions, decimals, um, everything. So I highly recommend that. Any suggestions for writing? I have taken it so many times. I have a writing online course, which gets into it. Um, and you know, we went through it on this, but I have a whole online course for writing. I would recommend for writing that you also focus on the multiple choice, try to get some extra points there and really work on your writing skills. You have to practice your writing skills. I have 10 argumentative prompts in my book and I have, um, several source-based prompts in the book. So definitely want to, uh, check that out. Okay. Any suggestions for reading? I talked about that at the beginning of the webinar. I have it in my book, but also if you need more released ACT tests, I'm going to send that out in the link. And I have a video on that as well. I'm going to send it out in the email. So um, that's going to help you with all of that. All right. Let me just show you a few more resources where you can get more information and then we're going to go. Okay. I'm so sorry. I'm so late. Hour and a half. All right. So let's... <clears throat> Okay, so this particular page here, which we've shared in the chat, it's got everything on it, but you can see that we have the different study guides. You can buy them separately or buy them in its entirety. If you need more than one subtest, buy the whole study guide. It will save you money. Don't buy them all separately. You get the full study guide at a cheaper price. But if you just need math or just need writing, you can just buy that. But if you need two or more, buy the whole thing. Then we have the online courses. You can buy the whole online course or you can buy them in subtests. Again, buy the whole thing if you need more than one subtest. Now, this these courses are very extensive, lots of video, lots of explanation. You are going to need some time to get through the, these courses. So if you have to take the test tomorrow, I wouldn't buy the online course. I might buy the study guide real quick, but I wouldn't buy the online course. Now, another thing is if you want a physical study guide, you can grab it on Amazon. All of the links are going to take you there, but you can see we did this in the beginning. Amazon, lots of five-star reviews. I can't give discounts on my Amazon books. Amazon sets the price. I can't do it. So um, you won't be able to use the discount code there, but you can use the discount code on my website. So uh, once you get the discount code and we put that in the chat, you'll also get it in the email. You can go ahead and grab that there. Um, now, let's say you're broke, you're teaching, and you're not making lots of money. That's okay. Go to my YouTube channel. If you go under playlists, I have playlists for Praxis, excuse me, Praxis Core. Um, I just did a geometry one, but this is math here. Praxis Core, these are all of the, the videos here. Let me just, I have uh, 18 videos just for the Praxis Core here. I have grammar, reading, all of that. Also, let me go back. My grammar playlist will help you. Where's grammar playlist? Praxis core reading. Praxis core writing. This is going to help you too. But I also have, I think I recently did a grammar. So it's going to be up here. Writing. Come on, grammar. I'm sure one of you sees it. It's here. I just added to it. Types of assessments. School leadership. Sorry, sorry. Where's my grammar? There it is. Here it is <laughs> down at the bottom. But I've just, um, I've got short videos, but I've got 24 videos just on grammar. This is going to help you with that multiple choice. All right. So 
definitely check out the YouTube channel. Um, of course, our, let's go back here, share this tab and set, oh, no, this tab, share this tab and set. This grammar course is going to help you with um, every single, like you can see, I go through, I go through each thing and talk about, uh, you know, I mark it up, I tell you why each one is, and it follows the book. So I would recommend that if you're really struggling with grammar. Of course, the math, the math is so big. It's got, if you're struggling with math, I break it up at number and quantity. We go through everything. Um, I give you all of the different ways. And then I go through and I have videos for all the things in the book where I show you exactly how to do it. All right. So if you have time for the course, I definitely recommend that. Um, what else was I going to show you? TikTok, TikTok. Um, I'm going to give you the TikTok video, but, and it's kind of down at the bottom. Here it is right here. E easy APA citations, this one here. Um, I go through regular citations here, but then I also do two or more authors, which I recently, here it is right here. The et al. Um, I talk about how to do it. See the at all here. So I'll link that up in the email I send you so you can go right to that. Um, if you're a TikToker, follow me on TikTok. I'm always doing test prep there. Okay. Um, let's see what else. Facebook, of course, we are live on Facebook right now, but we also have a robust Facebook. If you prefer Facebook, I'm on Instagram. I'm on all of that. So, you know, check it out. And, um, I think that's it. I wonder if I'm forgetting anything. Um, which, what questions do you have? Does anybody else have any more questions before we wrap it up? All right. Heather says, my favorite professor always said, just keep moving forward. Yes. Yes. And he was a genetics teacher. I taught genetics in high school for high school kids. I was a biology teacher in high school. And that is true. One foot in front of the other. The, the rear view mirror is very small compared to the windshield. Like we got to look back a little bit, but we don't need to be driving looking back, right? Look forward, keep moving forward, keep going. You will pass. Don't give up. I bought your book and course. Thank you so much. Awesome, Heather. Angie, thank you. All right, guys, I'm going to let you get back to your Saturday. Thank you so much for hanging out with me today. Be on the lookout for that email. It's going to have everything and the extra stuff that I talked about. I have it written down here. I really appreciate you. Let, let us know if you have any questions. Info at KathleenJasper.com. I appreciate all of you so much. Have an awesome day. Bye now.